I have a friend, Harry DeWitt, who runs High Plains Dairy. It's now got a new name. He's in Ohio and Texas, a couple other places. And he's got, there's six dairies that do financial, or do comparisons with each other. And when they were comparing each other, he realized his pharmaceutical costs, medical costs, were higher than his competition. One of the things they started drilling down into it, he realized, we're using the same products. I'm using the same protocols. It turns out I'm not using any more quantity they are. The difference is, I am paying $16 per unit, they're paying 12 We have the same supplier. It took one call, and he's now paying 12 bucks. But that hadn't occurred to me. Now, Harry's deal was it only saved me $30,000. He's got like 10,000 of the cows. So he said 30,000 here, 30,000 there, eventually adds up. Now, the numbers may be different from you or whatever. Okay, the 80 20 rule. This is something that's good to talk about, too. All of you probably know what the 80 20 rule is. It's called the Pareto Principle in Economics. What it says is that 20% of what you do accounts for 80% of your results. You can go to church. 20% of the people give 80% of the money. You go to bank. 20% of your customers account for 80% of your volume, your profit, almost anything. The issue is you have to figure out what those are. It's setting priorities. All of you know who Stephen Covey is? was he wrote the book Seven Habits of Highly Effective People and one of his habits is you have to do first things first now one of the problems I see most farmers and anybody else in this world not accomplishing their objectives even if they're trying to do this is because they do second things first they put their priorities down there. It's not enough to put your priorities down. You have to prioritize your priorities. So you get that 20%. They've got to be in order too. Which ones are most important? Because when people do second things first, they do what they like to do. They do what they know how to do. They do what the, if you got checklists, they can get started on, get finished quicker, get marked off. Or... They do what's urgent. And by the time they've done all those, they never get around to these. Because a lot of the really high priority, major county or anything like that, might take you three years to get implemented. I want something I can check off my list. If you're trying to train the next generation, they need to be engaged in that and help you see it. And also, it's a way to develop them. Part of the reason you do second things first is on the others, but you don't have time to do it. The average farmer, if he or she are the only one, they don't have time to do everything. To be successful at it, and that's why over time some of these intermediate businesses get but where they have specialists, that they delegate out some of those duties people, your successor ought to be taking on some of these things that are really important, but you don't have time to do them all. They ought to be doing a couple of those. It'd be good training for them. It'd get those things done. The 5% rule. When I got out of the farm credit system, it occurred to me that I had seen farmers, nobody was talking about it much, but the entire time now, their net worth was going down because their land was going down on the market rate. But they made money every year. My father-in-law was one of those. I remember when I was executive of his estate, I was in at his attorney's office. He said, I'll tell you one thing about your father-in-law. People talk about him being a good conservative, but forward-thinking businessman. He said, I've been doing his taxes since the beginning of the 80s. And there's never a year he didn't pay the maximum Social Security taxes. Well, it says he made money every year. 
some years more than others. But what I did, I got a bank, one of these big merged entities, that said, we saw the same thing. What was it that differed? So I, I took from 1982 to 1987, six years over the bottom of the farm financial crisis. And I divided the farms into six types. Some of these don't even exist anymore. Feral to fish hog operations, not just gore units. Dairy, cow calf operations, wheat operations. Cotton operations and corn and soybeans. This was a bank merge over larger. But one I took for six years. So I had the ups and downs a little bit. But I only compared, because of one year maybe this type of farming was profitable, this type wasn't. I only went to compare them to each other. And I had, my measure of success was to increase in earned net worth. I took the top 25% versus the bottom 25% versus the average. What I found is even during that period of time, now you got to realize the very bottom end wasn't in this because they weren't there the full six years, is that the range was that the top end did about 5% better than average, the bottom end did about 5% less. And this is on six different types of farm. Now, I can tell you it wasn't exactly five. It ranged from 7.2 to 3.6%. Because I was taking the average side, top 25% versus not just an individual farmer who could have varied around. But what I found is that they did it over and over and over again. The example I can give you, if any of you maybe in a good word to say fan, follow baseball a little bit so you're familiar with it. Okay, if you have two hitters, this is a simple example I use in class, my class, can, even though we're Aggies, they can understand this, uh, is that a guy who had 300 Lifetime bad and average. He'd been up 10 years or more. One, he was getting all of the you know, ads and other things. He keeps that up for another 15 years, retires, he's going to be in the Hall of Fame. This guy's making about 15 million a year. Okay, you take the average position player in Major League Baseball, he's sitting about 250. Now, he's not exactly struggling. He's making about a million and a half a year. But he, if he's doing ads for his local Chevrolet dealership, um, he has to make the team every year. Everybody's scared to death this one when he comes to bat. The others, you know, we pitch to him. How many more hits does 300 hit to get than the 250 if they're up about 20 times? One. He gets six, the other guy gets five. But what they do? He does it over and over and over again. And it just, if you think of these little differences, there are several things. They're cumulative. If you keep doing them each time, they add to your base. They're multiplicative. If I have 5% higher yields, it's 5% higher prices. On the extra 5%, I'm getting 5%. And if you remember your basic finance, it's compounding. So if you start looking at the net worth, the average guy goes like this. He changes when the things get better, and then he rocks along. And he changes either when he's forced to or because there's something new that gives. And if this other guy is just continuously making changes, and there's a compounding effect, they get different all the time. Dave Lenz looked at the data of the University of Minnesota farm financial data, FinBen, and he found from 2003 to 2012 taking the top 20% versus the bottom 20% on net farm income, the difference got wider every year. Okay, that's the 5% rule. It isn't a matter of being the best 
it's been at least average in all the key performance areas because we looked at cost per unit, production per unit, asset turnover ratios, other things like that. Production per unit. It was about five or six major factors in, in looking at that. Last one, you know, who, well, this isn't the last. Jim Collins, good to great. Those of you who read the book, looked at it, heard quotes out of it, one of the things he said is that the very best companies, and this deals with standard operating procedures too, spend as much time analyzing what they need to change or stop doing as they do evaluating new opportunities. Now, like, I will use the example here of my son-in-law. He used to work with Dynegy, which as far as I know doesn't even exist anymore. My daughter worked for Enron, which she loved. Doesn't exist anymore. She's the number two person in Shell Finance now. And well, actually, just in Shell Finance, North American Petroleum Financing, but as of last Monday, or the second or whatever it was, she, there's also not only shell financing for North American Petroleum Financing, there's shell financing for North American Petroleum Products. Her job for the next 18 months is to merge those two. My son-in-law, though, when he got out of college, was working in Dynegy in a unit that had eight college graduates. These kids make it 60 or 70,000 a year. They were taking information on different spreadsheets and putting it into the other ones. And Shane said, have these idiots never heard of macros? So he spent the weekend developing macros. Gave them to his boss on Monday, who in turn gave it to the IT people. Two weeks later, they eliminated six of those eight people. Now, they didn't get fired. They got, the company was big enough and growing, they moved somewhere else. But if they were, let's say, just 60,000, six of them, he saved them 360,000 that year and for the years after just by rating macros, which took him a weekend. When he got his next paycheck, he got a $25,000 bonus. Now, it was minuscule relative to what he saved them, but it was big enough to make an effect on him. He was looking for other things all the time that I could do. What do you stop doing? What we're doing. Or change what we're doing. Maybe one of the things I think, if, how many of you have standard operating procedures in place for the, the repetitive things you do in your business? Okay, I would suggest more of you did. It's what, how do we do this? So that if you've got a new guy being employed, or if you're cross-training somebody has to take over another job for a while, he knows what's involved in it. That isn't enough. If you're to continuously improve, you need to develop a system for incentivizing employees. If you can figure out a way to combine steps, or if you can figure out some things we're doing that we've always been doing that we don't need to do anymore, the one thing you need to be able to do is if you're looking at what's the cost savings or the efficiency increase or the revenue increase, if we do these things, you got to look at it from a partial budgeting standpoint. That means what's it do to the total revenue of the business, to the total cost and other things. Because I can make things more efficient here and I can screw up somewhere else in the business. You've got to look at it in terms of, analyze it in terms of what's the whole effect, so what's the net impact on the business. And if you want people to buy in and to be looking for things all the time, you've got to find a way to incentivize them. If they come up with something that makes it better, reward them. You'll get the guys to the lowest level of the company to the top looking for things of that nature. Okay, the E-Myth Principle. Have you ever read the book E-Myth Principle by Michael Gerber? Oh, good. One. <laughs> Congratulations. There's the E-Myth Principle. He has a lot. But one of his principles is this. Every company has four constituencies 
They have suppliers of goods and services. They have buyers of goods and services they produce. They have employees and they have funding sources, whether those are investors or lenders. He says what you need to do, whether it's hire an independent writer from a farm magazine or something, to go talk to people in each of those groups. Not about them doing business with you. It's just what for a landlord, for example, an agri what frustrates you about dealing with farmers? as customers or what frustrates you about working for farmers or leasing to them. Figure out the three to five biggest frustrations. If you can eliminate or reduce those frustrations, you will become the employer of choice, the landlord of choice, the borrower of choice, and the supplier of choice. You just need to know what they are. And you need to make darn sure not only you do better at them, but you let people know you're doing better at them. That's the myth principle. The last two I'm going to hit, I'm going to take longer to hit, but I'm going to jump over them. Peer advisory groups, and strategic alliances, pooling arrangements, alternative business models. First of all, I want you to think about this before you go into peer advisory groups. Every one of us, I don't care how smart you are, whether you, me, you, the brightest person you know, exists at any time in four states of knowledge. There's some things you know what they know. There's some things that you know you don't know. That's not bad. If you know you don't know it, you can go look for it. And then there's some things you don't know what you don't know. That's called ignorance. That's not the same thing as stupidity. You're just clueless. You're unaware of it. And then there's the last one. I use politics for this example a lot, but and some of the religious things too. It's where you think you know and it just ain't so. This has been attributed to Mark Twain, Satchel Paige, Ronald Reagan, a lot of others. One of the reasons for peer groups is so you can share what you know in the first case, you can get the answers second, and you can challenge, you can learn about the things in three you just didn't know about until you find out about them, and you can get challenged in the other. I wrote coordinated financial statements for agriculture. Then the Farm Financial Standard Task Force came around. If you look at the results of it, about 95% of it is coordinated financial statements for agriculture. But there were several things that people challenged us, people I respected, people that knew what they were doing. I realized this can be made better. I've just been taking it for granted because I developed it, that this are, there are better ways. And that happened there. There's a book called The Breakthrough Company. It's about small companies. It follows a protocol that Collins did in Good to Great, looking at small, successful companies. He said, human beings who are almost unique in their ability to learn from the experiences of others are also remarkable for the disinclination to do so. Okay, peer groups, purpose and objectives. Why, do you, why would you ever consider doing this if it, if it structures a true peer advisory group? Is to get different points of view, different advantages, to have a sounding board, to help you anticipate some things, to compare yourself against. You got to get down to the trust level in this. But that's what you're trying to do. You need this group outside of your business so they don't all have the same experience. You want to make it up of people who are good, that you respect, that are not probably, if possible, your direct competitors so that you aren't risking giving away your secrets. Then there's structure and composition. Most of these groups range from six to ten people. One of the things I'll tell you, this is my advice to everybody, and it's, it's humorous to some extent, but it's true. 
You want to soar with eagles, you don't want to scratch with turkeys. You want this group to be all people that if possible are as good or better than you are. Not at everything, you want them to challenge you. You get with a bunch of losers, I'll give you, they complain about everything's everybody else's fault. They be, it's like, I don't know about you, where I come from, and I'm a long way away, it's your coffee shop crew. You can go in there, they'll bitch about you. You can go in there every week and it's the same thing as last week. I can go in there once a year, it's like watching a soap opera. I can catch up on all the stuff, our high school football games, whatever they think of Obama or whether it's whoever it is. But it's the same crap. It, it's just kind of they feed on their victimism, if you would. You want people that usually are a little ways away, not competitors. One of the things I think is really, I'll mention his name because I don't think he's here and I don't think he minds me saying it. Do you any of you know Donnie Jensen? Okay. All right. When he comes to a peer group at t -Pen, he brings his son and his daughter. And he says, his trips back from that meeting and to it are about as valuable as me. He's training his successors. That's one of the advantages. You can see what other people are doing, not just what dad tells you, what's worked, what hasn't worked, what's something. Maybe we ought to try that. Guidelines for success requirement. One, there needs to be a confidentiality agreement. So if things happen here, they don't get talked about outside. A non-compete agreement if possible. That's why you try to get them far enough apart. I think a group needs a facilitator. One, to keep the meeting on schedule, to get the agenda, to, not to be the teacher, but to keep it on track, to get to watch people enough to know this one's getting quiet because something's bugging him or her. Talk to them about it a little after. To keep the people like me, the big mouths, under check, you don't need to talk all the time. Or the people that just plain can't stand being criticized. I have a friend that says the best thing about he's met once a month for 20 years with his YPO peer group. And he said it is the best management development thing he has ever been in. He said, because every meeting I hear something I don't like to hear, but I need to hear. These groups have succeeded outside agriculture, YPO, Vistage, Acria in Argentina. There's 200 and some groups, about 2,000 members. And partially it's because I don't know how many have been to Argentina. One of the reasons they need to do this is they have the most screwed up government in the South America, I mean, agriculture just seen, they got the greatest resources going, but they got a government that just sees ag as a source of revenue. They'll change things at the last moment. One thing about these, they typically cost, you can have some free by extension or by your quantity group or something, but the ones that professionally run outside of you are typically going to be cheap at 6,000, maybe up to 15,000 a year. And you're going to have to travel to them. I can't afford that. I think right now, under tough times, it's probably more important that you, you say, well, I don't want to, you know, I'm going to cut down on all costs. One of the things I think you need to think about with this is don't look at it as just an expense. It is an investment in continuous learning. This needs to be a participative learning process. Not just you go there and sit there and hope to absorb some knowledge. You gotta, if you want this thing to work, you gotta be part of it. You gotta invest in it. I don't know how many of you have ever heard the MIT Slow Management Review. It's a lot like the Harvard Business Review. May, may not, maybe that discredits it all together for you, but just, they did a survey of these CEO peer groups. They said, 
100% of the members agreed that it improved their company's performance. 100% agreed they'd obtained new knowledge. Now, some people think, I got to go there and I get all this. A lot of times, it's only one thing. 90% agreed it improved the organization and the professionalized 88% that developed clear performance benchmarks. Okay. What I want to go over are some reasons why I think peer groups are important. And this gets back to your successor development. I think if your successor or potential successor goes with you, they're not just hearing it from you, they're he hearing it from other people that have been successful at what they do. They see it's not just us, it's them, and it's other things. One, to get multiple vantage points and different perspectives. Everybody in a business may come from different backgrounds, but mostly what they've seen has been from their area and their commodity, their business. This is other people that don't have... They haven't been in your business, they just say what they see. A sounding board view, plans and ideas. You were thinking about doing this. What have we missed? Have you thought about this? Honest and constructive feedback. That's what Murray says. I hear every time something I don't want to hear. But I respect these people. And after I get over it, I realized I needed to hear that. Identify an alternative explain what if scenarios, the what ifs. This is a big one. Learning from each other's successes and mistakes. If you are truly honest, and I tried this, didn't work. What can I learn from what they did wrong? You can learn as much from your mistakes as you can the things that go right. Insight and objectivity. These people can see things, but they don't have, you know, with inside the business, I'll say this about you or their dad, if I'm family members or an employee, there's some things, or husband and wives, we've learned we don't talk about because they get mad. That may lead over to personal relationships. These guys just say it like they don't have to live with you. Okay. Reduce and overcome the implementation issues. What should you anticipate? Because everything you do doesn't work out just like you said. Is there something you should anticipate? This way you can avoid it. If it happens, this way you can, this may be the quickest way to try it around it, to alternate. Benchmarking, whether it's best practices, whether it's marketing, whether it's incentive programs, whether it is financial. Like I said, I don't think even most farmers have a clue how well they're doing against the competition. Identifying opportunities for collaborative efforts. Not in everything. Harry DeWitt, this guy talked about with the dairy. These other big dairies, you know, how many of you are dairymen? Okay. All these guys have rotary dairies or parlors and big ass fans. That is a name. To work on them, they need a scissor lift. Why should every one of us own a scissor lift? We just need to cage. They, they went together and they bought one scissor lift. They move around between, I don't know how much it costs, twenty or 30000 but now they don't each one need to do that same thing and let it set and gather dust most of the year. Improve timeliness and acting on problems and opportunities. You see things I want to, hmm, think of, these guys push you. Do something, you know, you've got a problem here. I remember one group, I I've been associated with that they had a problem employee. He was a cancer because of other people problem. And they had tried to counsel with him, you know, the consequences. And what we said is, look, you've done this two or three times. Tell him this time it's it. You've got to straighten your act up or you're gone. He's gone. He just can't help it. 
And he was, but the trouble was, he had worked for this guy a long time, so he didn't want to get rid of it. And the other is he was very good technically, but he was destroying the morale. He, he had people he didn't like or that they did something wrong, guy's bad side. So he put him in a position to punish him and then just leave him there. They're better off being rid of him. Seeing the bigger picture, the not all the U.S., but outside of ag, outside of the U.S., other things. <clears throat> Getting those perspectives. Expanded information access. Each of these people has a network. You got a problem? They may know somebody that can deal with, help you. Or if you need an employee or whatever else it is. And if you get one of my big beliefs in T-PIN, even though it's got an overhead charge with it, you're not going to do, is that if there are a bunch of facilitators, each with three or four peer groups, if the facilitators will access the other facilitators, we haven't got anybody here that's really done that before. Maybe we can check the other facilitators and find out there is somebody, and we could pay to bring them, either we need to go to the business on a trip, or bring them to us and pay their cost just to hear their story. Do I know different strengths and weaknesses? Some of you are going to be good at marketing, personnel management, technology, IT. Some of you aren't going to be so good. Nobody can be good at everything. Education needs based training. Maybe you all decide, and I'll, just, I'll use this example, this won't be a good one. You don't understand enough about futures and options strategies. Or how do we use insurance with options or whatever else to develop a comprehensive marketing program. We need training. My son might really knows what we want to do. My extension service may not offer a program in that area. Maybe this is the best person. We go out and get the best person. These guys charge from three to ten thousand bucks a day plus expenses. If it's a three-day program, thirty thousand bucks may be a little more than I want to pay for training. But if I get another couple of peer groups together and we bring not only us, but we bring our risk manager together, so there's thirty or so people in the room, and I divide that cost into that, and it really makes a difference. A thousand bucks a day is peanuts. Because it means we do it right now. Plus the fact we get it, we have our own questions, but other people ask questions we never thought about that we learned something from. Accountability, you say you're going to do something, you don't have to. This group has no governing control over you. But they will make you feel guilty. You said you did, you came back, you didn't. Why not? Or, well, you, know, you don't to not open your mouth on what you're going to do unless you, And a lot of times you do. You open your mouth just because you need that pressure to move you. Overcoming isolation, if you're the CEO of an operation, particularly a big one. You don't talk to your neighbors. They hate you anyway. If, or you've been out, nobody else in your operation has been the CEO before. There's a few different pressures you have. Some of these other people have. Encouragement, support, and understanding. That's, if it sometimes get tough, and some of these groups get, it's not just business. It may be relationships with my son. I may be having family problems. Don't pump me up, see me through it, maybe recognize where I've contributed to it or just, you know, anything. When you get down, you know, who else has been in your shoes? Maybe some of them. Last is pushing you out of your comfort zone. There's two times this is critical. One, when things are going really well because you get complacent. The others, when things get really bad and the margin of error is very small, I need somebody to keep bump. You know, I'm about to, you know, start suffering from depression, give up. 
somebody that helps me see it through that. Okay. This is Julie DeTonales, if you have that. She's the T-Pain coordinator. There are a lot of others. Like I said, Jason does some things here in Cornell. There are individuals that run peer groups. That will be in your handouts, I think. Here's something I think you need to think about. To remain independent, a lot of producers are going to have to become more interdependent. I'm not sure if this next slide shows it or not yet yeah, does. This is the census of agriculture data for about the last 20 years. Now they didn't even start keeping operations with over 5 million gross sales until 92. But what I've got up here is the number of farms out of 2.11 million that have gross sales of over two and a half million. This includes this group. But if you look at those trends, four tenths of one percent of all the farms in the United States produce about a third of the output. Forty-four percent produce, I think it's one percent of the output. You get down to the next one, two thirds of the output is produced by about 3.9% of the farm, 7.5% produce over 80%. My feeling is if trends continue, not what I believe that's the way it should be, not, within 10 years, 1% of the farms will produce over half the output of the country, and 5% will produce over 80%. Now, I will tell you, if you've ever looked at the census of ag data, what it qualifies to be a farmer. Mike Duffy, a friend of mine from Iowa State, says 75% of the farms wouldn't even qualify as good 4-H project. That's uh, in what the census calls a farm. But all I'm saying, it's consolidated. It may slow, it may speed up, or whatever, but the trends, even during the 80s, you can send continue to see that happening. Why would you figure out some way to work with others? I don't know, maybe it's to have a joint operating team, maybe it's to share equipment, maybe it's to just have a, a service bureau, maybe it's to form a close call. You've got Cayuga Marketing Group here in New York, they do some things together. You've got select milk producers and that join together with DFA and form Southwest Cheese. Uh, but to get economy scale, to reduce your cost per unit, have any of you read Top Producer Magazine? Ever seen it? There's a guy named Chris Barron out of Iowa called the Margin Manager, I think it's his name, or what they call him. But he runs the Fun Group, Farmers United Network. There's a bunch of farmers who are going together and form one pretty good, they have an operating, they own their own land, but they can buy bigger piece of equipment that are technologically suited to their operation. They can do what they're good at and not have to do other things. Somebody's better at marketing, somebody's better. And they may be big enough now we can afford to hire a accounting person. Some cases, it's to obtain market access. There are some markets that unless you offer enough volume, you can't get into. United Food Services purchasing go up. I use this one as just one example. Have any of you ever heard of this? It's a close cooperative owned by the Yum, Y-U-M, brand companies. Yum brand companies used to be part of PepsiCo. They split off its Kentucky Fried Chicken, KFC, Taco Bell, Pizza Hut, Long John Silver's, and A&W Root Beer. They use one closed co-op in Louisville, Kentucky to do all their purchasing and others for the stores. A couple years ago, there were a little over 200 people in this firm. They had over $6 billion worth of business. Now my point is, if companies that are considered national brands and are as big as they are, why does some million dollar, 
10 million, 100 million dollar farm said, we can do things better by ourselves. Maybe, some areas, some areas I don't think so. Okay. There's a lot of things. I had three farmers that listened to Dick Whitman talk about managerial accounting. These guys were five to 10,000 acre Midwest operations. Not huge farms, but good size. So they went out to find somebody. They knew they needed a CPA that knew cost of had probably been working for a manufacturing company. Well, the trouble is those people wanted 150000 a year plus benefits, and they didn't want to be doing data entry. So what they found is a woman who was a controller for a set of six grain elevators. Did grain, trucking, chemical, seed, feed, fertilizer, etc. Now she was working about 60 hours a week. She loved what she did. But she also had two children who were like 9 and 11, something like that. Her husband was president of the bank. So they had good benefit programs. These three farmers said, instead of us doing it together, we tell you what, we will rent an office. We will hire a data entry operator for you. We'll get the kind of accounting program you want. You can work for us for 30 hours a week and you pick the hours. We will pay you $75,000 to set up a 401k. What they had, their total cost this thing was 150,000 bucks. Divided three ways, it was 50,000 apiece. This is the best money they ever spent. She not only does cost accounting, she benchmarks them. She's a member of the executive team. She tracks vendors, handles accounts payable, and she does calculates her ratios and everything. She does budget versus actual performance month to date and year to date. And she also does feasibility studies for them when they're looking at things. He said, we can't believe, what we, this woman is extremely bright, they knew her from high school, but there are three of them sharing the costs, this little service bureau. Risk management, I told you earlier, Donald DeYoung, that's not revealing any secrets. He hired a grain merchandiser, Perina Mills, who works for the Ag Vision. He happens to not only input risk management grain stuff for the company, the dairies that are part of this, but he does, he's pricing grain for about 250,000 cows outside. And they do lots of other things. Import purchasing, contracting, just having volume. You know, you can get a lot better costs on seed and some of the other fertilizer stuff if they only have to deliver one place and you buy big amounts. You may get a 20% discount or so. Import and export, I know five companies in Southern California especially growers to set up a marketing company. They hired a guy who marketed in the Pacific Rim. He goes over and gets contracts, bring them back to the group. They have the right of first refusal. If they don't do it, then he will find another to grow up for them. I, I'll skip with the feed mills. There are five dairies in Southern California that built up a single feed mill. And the reason they did that is they now bring unit trains in instead of having to pay for trucking of grain on specific things. I know some that have repair shops, they hire mechanics. This way, in the, everything is overhauled in the winter. And then they have some people that can do specific work you know, if something breaks down during the season. Machine equipment sharing, these self insurance pools are captive in insurance. Genetics, I know a embryo transfer operation that also does AI work. They don't own any of their own studs or cows. They pick really good ones of guys that have maybe four or five or six that fit that model. They do all the marketing, they raise them, they collect the semen, they implant the heifers or the cows and harvest the embryos and they transfer them. The grower maybe only gets 40%, they get 60%. But they couldn't afford to do all that technical work or marketing without this group. There's all kinds of examples. Guys that build fertilizer condos on the river so they can bring them. But there's no end to this. I just think it's a way to look at it. All right. Now you may say, well, those are major practices for us. 
I think each one of them, if you involve your successor in, if you want your successor to develop and get other ideas than just what you have, they will become better managers and they'll learn some things that you wouldn't have taught them otherwise. We may quit part way through this and come back later. But this is looking, in a, apart from what I did the other one for, because I thought that's a critical part of successor development, is look at this one. There's a guy named Mark Bowler who wrote the book Exit Right, Leave Your Business, or Retire From It. He says 60%, and this is an all-family business, not just farming, of management transitions that fail are due to unresolved conflict or communication issues. 25% are due to poorly prepared successors. I think you, a lot of you heard Dave Cole, most of you in this part of the country know who Dave is or have heard him somewhere before. There's two people that are just as screwed up as I am. One of them is Dave Cole and the other is Mike Bolge. And, uh, <laughs> But I, because they do think that way, I, these two have to be two guys I listen to a lot. Okay, he said, successful management transitions don't just happen, they're planned. Okay, here's 10 practices of firms that I have seen over the course of the last 30 years have successful transitions. What have they done? One of them is they take the family or the, the stakeholders, include not just the dad, not just the dad and the mom or the dad and the successor, get together, maybe even bring somebody else in, the, the group of advisors or whatever they're using. And they assess the needs of the business, not just now, but for the future. One thing you don't want to do is clone yourself. You don't need somebody who thinks like you do, not if they're going to be running a business 20 years or 30 years. You want some of your basic values installed in them. That's important. But they've got to start get outside of that box. Because I noticed in the 80s there were a lot of people that failed that were honest as day as long, trying the hardest, but they were doing what the market no longer rewarded. Is this, does this person bring some vision of this operation? I don't mean it's just your exact opposite. You just fight all the time or anything, but just what does the business need? Not only now, but what's happening. I wrote, I don't know if you've read DTM, but I wrote, 12 things that I thought were going to affect agriculture most over the next 10 years. An objective assessment of strengths and weaknesses of the current CEO. You may be very good, but there's probably some areas you could stand a little work on. Okay. This is another one. An objective assessment of strengths and weaknesses of either the successor or the potential successors. This one gets to be, overrides almost everything else. Open and honest and mature communication. This isn't a parent-child discussion. It's two business people. You don't have to agree. The fact is, conflict is normal. And if growth's going to occur, conflict needs to occur. Conflict doesn't mean you're standing up throwing blows, you just don't agree. The other thing you need to understand is there's a, let's see, was it Kofi that had this uh, solution? A lot of people think that solutions are if you've got two positions arriving in the middle. That's compromise. That's not what it is. It's working on them long enough to find a solution that's a little better off for both parties. If you had this right once, I'll see if I...
put this in my pocket. Okay. It's called win win. One is if you have to change it a little bit, you finally come up with something that's a little better than either of you started off with. And that takes a lot of work. It, the one thing you'll find about success or development, there's not the one thing, there's two things. Communication, which means talking, instead of, I don't sure that's, you know, the hermetically sealed doesn't need to imply inside the business. So that's one of the big parts of it. Being honest, we get our feelings hurt sometimes, but just this I see it. How do you see it? You know, kind of asking why and getting to be better at that. The creation of a management development plan that addresses the experience, the responsibility, the training, the feedback that the successor needs to develop. The sixth one is planning the exposure and experience and networking for the successor, not just outside your business, but outside your industry. One of the best things I ever did was go to the Inc. Magazine Rapidly Growing Con or Company Conference. A lot of the stuff you could get was going to be what you see the, farm, the most progressive farmers use in their operation. They could take it, adapt it, put it to work here. Development of the common business, vision for the business. I think you need to, not just these two, unless these two is all there is. If you're going to have other owners, and if you've got four kids and four of them are going to own part of it, but just one or two is working in the business, if I've got an ownership interest, Let's say, what do we, what do we want this thing to look like? If we ever, you'll never get there. If you do, you ought to be moving the thing. It's like looking at the horizon. The closer you get to it, the horizon is farther off. That's the nature of the world. An ongoing delegation, responsibility, authority with a specific timeline. If you're going to develop a successor, it's not just naming who it is. And then we're going to, in five years, it's going to happen. So they go along doing their same job, and then I walk away one year. It's given them a Because if you want to know who is best qualified to be your successor, maybe there's more than one. Give them more responsibilities and see how they handle it. I mean, you... Nobody knows how well somebody's going to do until they've been in there. When I was a lender, the best way to judge management is to watch them go through a tough time. What did they do? How did they, were they open and honest with Did they change the way they did something? Did they buckle down? Did they give up a little family? Something. Okay. Involvement of the successor in the development of the business plan and the strategic planning process. This could be the management team too. When you put the, how does all this stuff to fit together? The marketing, the finance, and the production, others. How do we bring this together? That's what a business plan is all about. If you don't do business plans, there's a reason to do them. This doesn't need to be some huge thing. I've seen strategic plans out of companies that are this thing. I mean, I think a lot of, say, 20 pages might be the biggest. You know, in the finance, what's our competition doing? What new developments are coming along? What's our pricing strategy need to be? What's our risk management need to be? How do we finance this? What's this do to us and things? An implementation of a plan for what the CEO is going to do next. Maybe he, will, he or she will be chairman of the board. Maybe they will become a part-time worker. I've seen farmers retire. My dad was like this. My brother couldn't believe it. Every time he came back for three years, he was sure, you know, he was going to jump from working a manager. And dad said, I'm the Indian, you're the chief. He came back in the fall, primarily, I'm sure, to watch my nephews play football and spring to plant. 
But he worked his butt off, and he was a good worker. But that's what he wanted to do. Others have just totally walked away from it. This is yours now. I'm out of here. Okay. One of the things about really, really effective farmers, not just right now, but is they work harder at communication. I don't mean they practice being a better orator or learning how to write better. I said this earlier, one of the biggest roadblocks blocks to progress in any business is secrecy. If you want buy-in and commitment from your employees, I, I've heard a lot of times, you know, well, the employees, my managers, those are hired men. They act like they were donkeys or something. That doesn't, there are some positions that can work for but by and large, if you really want people to be engaged, and you're going to find most people that go to business that you hire would really like to perform well, they are, you'll get a few that are just there as mercenaries. I'm there to draw a paycheck and just do my job. But some would like to be able to be better. They need to understand where the business is headed. Where are we trying to go? The vision statement. Exactly what are we going to try to do to get there? What's got to change? Would I fit into this? You know, most people don't go along with change or resist it because they think they're going to be displaced. Or they're going to have to start doing something they don't like to do. How do I fit in this? What's in it for me? One of the things may be if we don't grow, we may be out of business and you aren't going to have a job. One of it is going to be maybe if this gets big enough, there's going to be different ways you can go. A lot of you have probably heard in Colin's Good to Great book, this all, where this came out of was not just there, it was, um, what was it, the world's best managers? You know, what they, there was something about what they do differently. I, I can't, oh no, it was break all the rules, what the best managers do differently. And part of it is they manage people as individuals. They didn't just have a stock way they treated everybody. They said, what turns this one on? What motivates them? Where do they, where do they need to be prodded or patted on the back? Or do they need public praise or just, you know, just tell me a good, do a good job, pay me well and leave me alone. I, the worst thing you could do is put me up in front of a group. But what's in it for me? I may have more options, ways to go. I may have a chance to get paid more for this business. More, I can be a supervisor. Or I can move into somewhere. I've been doing this, but that isn't really where my talent lies. I'd like to do more of this. Some of you know Craig Yunker from Elba. Uh, he's got a woman that I think does the logistics and some of the other stuff. He used to be a tractor driver. And what he found out is she was better at this. And so he moved over there. It's been better for the whole operation. Employees and family members. What do they expect to do? Well, it's, you know, do your job. What exactly do you mean? What is your onboarding process like? What is your follow-up like? You may bring somebody in and give a whole day or two days training about what they Are they going to remember all of that? They're a whole lot better than me. This is a big one. This came out of the Vietnam War. Why are you doing it? You know, somebody says, well, why am I doing that? What's your standard answer? This was my dad's. Because I told you so. Okay. We used to say all the time at home when we'd go, my dad was an ex-Marine. Well, I think, he said, how do you know what you think? I haven't told you yet. He didn't mean that. We'd say something, he'd ask us, why? Had we considered alternatives? What was the rationale by it? This was a Socratic method. You got dug into, uh, what if this doesn't work? What do you propose at that time? 
But we, he said, use your head. That was the, as much as anything else over here is use your head. Okay. The other thing is people want to know is how are they doing? Not just my once a year performance review or when I get chewed out or the time I'm told, attaboy, how are you doing? We'll get to this later. The other thing really good employees want, the type you want around, is how can I improve? Not just how am I doing, but is there a way I could do better? Because it's going to do several things. I'll feel better about the job I have, but I become way more employable if you decide not to. And there's people that don't. Just that, I, they want them to stay there. They don't want to lose them. The best coaches I've ever seen are guys that have guys that go on to become head coaches somewhere else because they get a reputation. We pick and we develop the best people out there. Okay, This last one, if you read this, it's about leadership. It said, if a leader can't get his message across clearly and motivate others to act on it, then having a, a message doesn't matter. You can blow hot air all the day long, but if people don't do anything different or don't respond to your message, that's exactly what you're doing. You're just blowing off. There are a lot of things you need to think about whether these apply to you. There are others. Most of these came from Don Jonovic, who I mentioned earlier. He said, among the communication problems that exist in a lot of family businesses, one is dictatorship. I'm the boss. You do what you're told to do. He called it the El Jefe and the Der Fuhrer model. <laughs> Everybody knows what it is. I say something, I don't expect anything, you know back from it. That is a great model if you are in the last generation of your business because it stinks as a way to develop successors. Secrecy, though hermetically sealed. People need to know those last eight questions. You need to be allowed to talk about things, to even disagree. Inability or unwillingness to admit being wrong. And this is equally as true of the CEO as it is of the successor. They get real defensive if they're challenged on something. I used to have a boss in the Farm Credit Bank who was the executive VP. I, and what I learned after about two times is if I wanted to do something, I wrote it out. I gave it to him and walked away. If I decided to push point at that point, he wasn't. He had position power. He wasn't going to lose an argument. He liked for people to challenge him. He beat them down. But if he took this and thought about it for a while, and as long as I didn't mind it being his idea, <laughs> it got better. We do things, but those were two things. Don't, you better learn quick. Don't argue the point right now. Definitely don't argue in front of other people. And the other is let him take credit for it. Unre unfortunately, a lot of people get defensive and other stuff about things. That's called immaturity. Unresolved conflict, this is a huge one in family business. And in some cases, you're either going to have to study how to resolve conflict, read on it, do a little bit, or you need to bring in a professional, a facilitator in conflict resolution. Because a lot of times what you have here is something that people on the outside never know why, but this is going on inside the business. And as long as dad or grandpa or grandma is in charge, it gets suppressed. And as soon as they die or go away, it blows up and it's what causes the business to go down. And sometimes I've seen dads and moms that don't care. 
you know, whatever happens after I'm gone, that's their problem. Uh, you may be the father, you are a miserable leader if you intend for this to be another generation. Okay. Not fighting fairly. What I mean by that, somebody who tries to get others to be on their side. Uh, a big one. When things go wrong, they start bringing up old issues. They don't stick to the point at hand. They start bringing other things up. You know, those sort of things are things that are, there's... I think you got a copy of a set of handouts I gave you. I don't know, this thing. Yeah, let me just point out. The first one is a woman out of Canada, 60 questions to consider. I mentioned there are a lot of consultants. I, I didn't know the New York Farm Link did this. They do, and they're not in here. Uh, I'm just going to go over some of these. Because what I wanted you to do is get back to... Uh, come on, where's... Want to get back. Whitman Farms has one in here about developing a family employment policy. Do you have to work somewhere else for so long? Do you need to have a certain level of education? Do you need to have earned at least one real promotion before we're going to consider letting you back? Do you need to be qualified with the positions open? There are families that say, you need a job, we will make one for you. There's, I've got the one in here about buy-sell agreements. There's a couple things about buy-sell agreements. You ever want to look at those? The one thing I'm tell you about buy-sell agreements is you ought to put them together using the, anybody that has a vested interest. If it's a spouse by marriage and you're in a community property state, the kids, they all will be in the room and it will be explained to them by an attorney. And the point is, if you're going to do this, put it together while everybody's getting along. So I don't know who's going to become disabled. I don't know who's going to get divorced. Whatever it is, put it in place, agree. This may not be exactly what I wanted, but if the shoe was on the other foot, what's fair? How do we value this thing? And I think, what should we cover in here? Should it be installment payouts? Should we use life insurance or first to die to cover other things? If you go, well, they aren't page numbers. There's a table of contents on Dick Whitman's uh, building successful farm management, effective farm management systems. It lets you know what's in there. He has what he calls management proficiency test on different key areas of management. You know, you could have different people in the business fill this out or different family members. What is their assessment? And then bring them together and compare them. Do they think we're doing this or do they think we're not? How good a job do they think we're doing? He's got a lot of templates and models in the back of it. There's the article, the successful Succession Development Management Succession. I wrote it out as about a 20-page article. There's one last thing on here. I think it was one of these. My student worker put them in there twice. I did. Just proves I don't proofread what I. This was all before TPAP, and I was trying to get a whole bunch of stuff off and marry it out. Three minutes? Okay. Not fighting fairly again. Things I talked about, what you, were you trying to get coalitions on your side? A lot of the thing that successor development, I think, addresses most of these things. Okay. We will come back to this after we take a break. How long is the break for? Half hour? Okay.